Good to see you this morning. I'm so glad that you're here. Anybody grow up going to youth group lock-ins? Nobody, two people, that's great. So two of you are gonna understand what I'm talking about. If you didn't grow up in church, if you didn't grow up like around church in the 80s and the 90s, greatest generation, I don't care what Tom Brokaw says, 80s and the 90s, got some amens there. But if you didn't grow up going, let me just kind of set the stage for you and, and unpack a little bit of this horrendous misery for you. Essentially, parents at a lock-in would take their middle school and high school kids, great idea, take them at seven o'clock and drop them off at church just to leave them to stay up all night long. And then the next morning at 7 a.m., they'd pick them up and all throughout the night, they'd do things in and around church. These teenagers would go bowling uh, at the local bowling alley. Teenagers would go to the arcade. They'd hang out at church and they would drink lots and lots of Mountain Dew. They would eat lots and lots of pizza and they would have lots and lots of organic grass-fed Sour Patch Kids and it was wonderful. (laughs) Because around three o'clock in the morning, after all of the teenagers had like shared their deepest, darkest corners of their entire life with each other, somebody would get on stage and share Jesus and lots and lots of kids would come to meet Christ. And then at 5.30 in the morning, we'd make pancakes and, and uh, send off all of the kids to be miserable for about seven days straight. It sounds horrible <laughs> because it was. One of my proudest accomplishments in ministry is uh, over the last 19 years of ministry is as long as I've been a pastor, youth pastor, college pastor, teaching pastor, now lead pastor, I have never allowed a lock-in on my watch to happen in Jesus' name. Those things are, are awful. But there are times in the Christian life, especially with everything going on in the world around us, Uh, with all of the difficulties in the world, with all of the weird that's happening in the world, there are moments where as followers of Jesus, we kind of want to lock in. We kind of want to barricade ourselves, kind of insulate ourselves from all of the world around us so that we can have kind of this holy huddle, this this safe space, this this place where we kind of lock ourselves in to, to stay away from all of the troubles of the world. And so if, if we're being honest this morning, there's part of this idea of a lock-in that's somewhat attractive, right? Uh, we could stay safe from everything going on in the world around us if we just kind of huddled up as a church together in community. There's another option that oftentimes cultural Christianity especially takes this posture, this position of spiraling into despair and hopelessness. Like this world is never gonna get any better. Nothing is ever gonna change. And so we're just gonna sit around and wait on heaven to come. But what if there's another option? What if instead of viewing church, viewing Christianity as this umbrella of safety from the world around us, what if there's this different option than than even spiraling into despair and hopelessness? What if we actually began to see with all of the imperfect people in the world around us, with all of the imperfect people who make up the church that is among us, What if we looked at and actually thought about, actually leaned in to what God was calling us to do and how he's inviting us to live in this moment in time? Paul captured it in his letter to the Corinthian church, a church that was living in a culture and a time and a point in history that was as gnarly and as crazy as maybe we could see our own culture today. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal, his gospel appeal, his life-changing appeal, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. What if we took God at his word when he said that he wants to use you and I as the salt and the light in the world around us. Last week, we introduced this idea as we're unpacking who we are as a church, the vision that God has for us as a community. We unpacked this idea of several different chairs representing several different people within our own community. There are people who society and even Christian culture would label as the nuns of our day. 
They don't have any categories for Jesus. They don't have any relationship with Jesus. Uh, they don't have any interest in being a part of a local church. This is that chair one. And then you've got people who, uh, like in chair two, who know about Jesus, who've maybe connected with the local church. They just haven't made that decision to personally follow Jesus. They haven't crossed that line, if you will, to say, Jesus, I trust you with my life. And then you have people who claim to follow Jesus, yet their life doesn't look anything like the life and the teaching of Jesus. Uh, they, they show up at church, they sing a couple of songs and then walk out completely unchanged. And then you've got people who have put their trust in Jesus have put their faith in their walking on a daily basis, hour by hour, minute by minute, trusting and following Jesus, and their life looks totally different. Their life looks like Jesus. For those of us in in these chairs, three and four, however nominal or, or meaningful your faith may be, God has called us as followers of Jesus to be salt and light. We spent the entire summer walking through the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus, right from the start, right from the very outset, says, you as my followers are a city on a hill. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And Jesus sets this stage that that people ought to look at us and see that we live different, that we live like Jesus. Not so that when everyone looks at us, they'll say, oh, look at how great those people are. Oh, look at, gosh, look at Mountain View Church. Look at how great Mountain View Church is. Now, Jesus says you're the salt of the earth and the light of the world, not so that people will say, look how great the preaching is. Look how unique Mountain View does church. Look how great the worship is. Look, man, the church building at Mountain View Church is awesome. All of which are true, minus the good preaching, but our hope, our prayer, what drives us as a church is that people would see our good works and give glory to our Heavenly Father. It's why we're couching this whole series in this Old Testament prophet, this cry from Habakkuk, when he said, Lord, I have heard of your good works. I have heard of your fame. Would you do in our day what you've done in days past? It's what Paul was talking about in Philippians when he wrote this letter to this young, brand new church, this church that modeled what diversity looks like in a church. The the first convert of the church, the first person who met Jesus at the church in Philippi, this Roman colony of wealth and culture and influence and fashion. The very first person who met Jesus in the city of Philippi was a lady named Lydia. Lydia was the Coco Chanel of her day. Like she was making and designing the fit that you would want to wear in our day today. Uh, Lydia, uh, God used Lydia to start this gospel movement in this influential city of Philippi, which is just this gentle reminder, just this subtle reminder that if you believe that God only uses men to do the work of the kingdom, you have not read the entirety of scripture because God uses both men and women to advance his kingdom here on earth. So you've got Lydia, the first convert of, in this city of Philippi. She helped to launch and plant the church in this city. Then you've got this demon-possessed teenage slave girl who's being exploited by her slave owners in that day. Uh, she was being exploited for their own financial gain. And every morning and every evening when Paul and Silas go out to preach the gospel, this teenage slave girl shows up and just starts scoffing. She's making life miserable. She's giving them grief every time they go and try to preach the good news of Jesus. But this demon-possessed slave girl meets Jesus And she is delivered from sin and the grave and her life of slavery. She has been set free because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which if that doesn't get you fired up this morning, check your pulse. I mean, anybody out there this morning, this little, this slave teenage girl was delivered and set free from slavery, which was good news for her, but bad news for the people who were making money off of her who made a living from selling her in the streets. And so they got frustrated, they got angry, and had Paul and Silas thrown into jail. 
Paul and Silas, just because they were thrown into jail, they weren't done with the ministry that God had called them to because in the middle of the night, instead of sulking in their sorrows and getting stuck as a victim of their own circumstances, they worshiped from their jail cell. God sent an earthquake that opened the prison cell doors. But instead of running, instead of seeing this as their ticket out of jail, Paul and Silas see this as a moment to step up and share the gospel with this rough and tough Roman soldier uh, who was at the peak of his career in exploiting people. And this officer in the Roman army met Jesus. This is the beginning of the church in Philippi. These are the three people that, that start this gospel movement in the city of Philippi, people from every different background imaginable. And Paul writes a letter to them and the others who subsequently have put their faith and trust in Jesus. And this is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. To these people, he says this, so if there's any encouragement from Christ... If there's any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. Paul says if you've got any of these things, if you've been encouraged by Jesus, if you've been comforted by the gospel, if you are united with Jesus, if you're part of this church, if you've received Jesus, if you've received the Holy Spirit, then listen up, I got a message for you. And this is the message from Paul. Verse 2, if any of this encouragement has happened, then complete my joy by being of the same mind, by having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What if we lived like this? Like, what if we just took this truth that Paul has for the believers of the church in Philippi, and we actually lived like this? Like, what if we, what if we lived like nothing was our own selfish agenda? What if we didn't show up with our, our own opinions of what church should do and how church should operate and how things ought to sound musically and what political ideologies ought to be covered and what should be avoided politically? What if we looked at other people as more significant than ourselves? What if when we looked at others, we said, this is a person worthy of respect and honor, regardless of what they drive, regardless of what they wear, where they live, who they vote for, no matter what's going on in their life, no matter what choices, this is a person worthy of respect because this is a person who's been created in the image of God. Now, Paul is not saying that everybody else in the world ought to live like this. Paul is saying that, that you and I, as believers, as followers of Jesus, ought to be defined in our life as living like this. Now, what Paul's not saying is he's not saying that everybody ought to like the same thing because we all like different things. People assume because I'm from the Nashville, Tennessee area that I must like country music, but I hate country music. <laughs> like, oh, now y'all are lively. Uh, I, I, I hate country music. That's my preference. You may love country music and you'd be wrong, but that's your preference. That's why the world has so many radio stations. That's why Spotify has over 4 billion playlists because we all have different preferences when it comes to music. The problem comes, Paul says, when we make our preferences into idols. When we make our preferences into things that become all self-centered, all about us. Paul says the problem comes when, we, when what we prefer gets shifted into what we feel like is our right. Can I, can I let you behind the curtain? Uh, let me just give you a sneak peek behind the curtains and tell you that even among our staff, even among our overseers, we don't all share the same preferences. We don't all agree on every single little thing. That's why we at Mountain View value unity over uniformity. What does that mean? We value being together more than we value just believing 
uh, as a carbon copy, every single thing. Now, as, uh, as Augustine uh, said, in the essentials, we have unity. There are things that are essential, bare essential to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe that the word of God is inspired by God himself. We believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. There are things that are essential and core foundational truths of the gospel that we are together. In the essentials, we have unity. In the non-essentials, we have charity. There are things that just aren't essential to the gospel, like what Bible translation you read. Uh, some people like the King James. Some people like the English Standard Version. Some people like the NIV. There, there's a whole lot of things, and, and that's okay. None of that impacts the foundation of the gospel. Uh, things like who we vote for, the politician that we tend to prefer uh, when, when we go to the ballot box. Uh, things like, are you an Apple user or an Android user? That might be essential, like that's probably essential to the gospel. <laughs> but you get what I'm talking about. In the essentials, we have unity. In the non-essentials, we have charity. We aren't all the same. We don't all like the same things, and that's okay. But we do worship the same God. Don't hear me when I say we worship the same God, that whatever God you choose to worship is just fine with you. No, that, no that's the gospel of Oprah. We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one God. We all worship the same God, which means, yes, we value unity over uniformity. And what that means is what we prefer doesn't matter as much as who we're with. Preferences matter, just not as much as relationship. What this means for us collectively as a community is that if we're going to reach people beyond just us, then we're going to have to stretch beyond just our own preferences, seeing that the sacrifices that we make with our preferences mean more people in these chairs get to discover and find home at Mountain View Church. We're gonna have to sacrifice and give up our preferences so that people in chairs one and two who don't yet have categories for Jesus, who don't yet understand why Jesus matters for them, we're gonna have to sacrifice and give up our preferences so that they can hear that Jesus loves them too. And Paul is reminding us that sometimes what keeps people in chairs one and two, sometimes what keeps people from trusting in Jesus is you and I fighting for what we prefer. If we have been saved by Jesus, we've been invited into a new kingdom, and my life, your life, has been radically changed, not because of something that I've done, not because of some good thing that I've accomplished, but by his works alone. And so our response to that is, you know what, this is not about me at all. We have this bend, we have this tendency in our selfishness, in our sin, in our brokenness, that we try to push ourselves to the center. We try to make life and, and this world around us and relationships, everything, we try to do everything that we can to make this all about us. But what God wants to tell me and tell you is this is not about me. It's not about you. Let's not make this all about us. Let's look out for each other. Paul goes on, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but to the interest of others. Verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is how we do it. This is getting practical now. So let's have a mindset shift and a mindset shift to be more like Jesus. Verse six, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And so Jesus, instead of leveraging the fact that he is the son of God, uh, instead of walking around saying, oh, sorry, let, let me just pick up that name I dropped. I, I'm the son of God. Instead of doing that, Jesus instead took on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men, in verse eight, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because of what Jesus has done, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, 
so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. This is the point that we get fired up as a church. This is the point that we say, amen. It's too late now. No, you've, you've already missed that boat. But this is the why. This is why we make sacrifices. This is why we push aside our preferences. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, because of what Jesus has done. Because Jesus came and died and rose again, he gave life to those of us who have put our trust in him. He said, therefore, this is what you should do. This is the encouragement, Paul says. Continue to work out your, your salvation with fear and trembling. Let's be very clear. Paul does not say here, work for your salvation. Paul says, work out your salvation. This is, this is not a working out like CrossFit. Okay, this is not body pump. This is not like Zumba. This isn't bar or cycle or spin or whatever style of workout you choose to. This is not what Paul is talking about when he's saying work out. Think about what Paul is saying, work out your salvation by some of the way that you and I work out when we regularly, monthly make a charitable donation to the gym of our choice. You see what I'm stepping in? We give them a gift every single month with no services received. You picking up what I'm putting down? Like we're paying for a gym membership, our, our family sees that, hit the monthly budget, but we're not actually going. That's the kind of working out that Paul is talking about. Paul says it's by grace that we're saved, not by works, so that none of us can say, hey, see what I've done to get this? Look at how good I've been. Look at what good I've done. Paul says, no, it's not about us at all, so that none of us can boast. But yet we're called to continue to live in such a way that shows that we're saved. Uh, listen, everybody look at me. No one and no spiritual discipline can make God love you. It's too late for that. God already loves you. Spiritual disciplines, working it out, helps us to live in God's love and offer God's love to others. This ought to be encouraging to you. It's encouraging to me because we don't have to have it all figured out. We don't have to have all of the answers. Uh, we don't have to have everything lined up perfectly because we are a work in progress. God wants to work in you to shape and mold and change you. But let me just tell you, this work doesn't happen osmotically. It doesn't just happen instantly, which means somebody this morning needs to nudge your neighbor and say, you got work to do. But the work doesn't start with you. It starts with Jesus, which means the invitation is this. You got to be changed by the grace of God. This isn't about how Christians achieve salvation, but make no mistake, this is about how Christians demonstrate salvation. This isn't a willpower thing. It's not a pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, it's not a follow this list of rules and regulations. There's nothing wrong with discipline. There's nothing wrong with habits, but the motivation can't be that we're trying to fix ourselves. It's God working in us. And I just can't help but think for, for some of us today, we get all wrapped around the axle thinking that we just can't, we can't seem to get rid of certain patterns in our life. We can't stop doing certain things, can't leave that old life behind. And if that's you this morning, can I just encourage you to check your power source? The, the spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that can take what's dead in your life and bring it back to life. In verse 14, Paul goes on. Somebody's fired up about it. <laughs> Paul goes on, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Let's just pause. What, 
Can you imagine the impact in the world that we would have if we just embraced this? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Can you imagine the impact on our world if we just embraced this? Uh, Listen, high theological positions aside, and I know I got a master's degree, I've got a doctorate, all in theology. Theology is important and it's needed. But if our theology does not lead to a greater love of God and a greater love of our neighbor, not some idealized neighbor, but if our theology doesn't lead to a greater love of God and our neighbor, then something is wrong. If our theology, if what we believe about God just leads to angry tweets, frustrated Facebook posts, vitriol, hate, arrogance, grumbling, arguing, it is not from God and it is not of God. Our love for neighbor, especially the neighbor who is nothing like us, our love for our neighbor is our proof of our love for God. And I'm just going to keep going. Y'all going to leave me hanging here. I'm going to keep preaching until somebody says amen. Can I go further? (laughs) Our theology, no matter how good, becomes irrelevant and idolatrous if it's not used in service of loving God and loving neighbor. How we live matters. We can't get caught up in the culture world's wars of our day. We've got a battle that's far more important than power and politics. You know how we get stuck and how we get trapped and how we get caught up in this culture war? It it happens when we have this idea that God is with us and not with them. It happens when we no longer see people as image bearers to be engaged, but as threats to be eliminated. We get caught up in the culture wars of our day when we believe that we're just fighting for the truth and so our anger is justified. We get caught up in it when fear is our primary lens through which we see the world. We get stuck and trapped and caught in the culture wars wars of our day. If If we're quicker to offer a lecture to somebody who just needs a hug, and as followers of Jesus... My opinions of others ought to pale in comparison to my love for others. This is what Paul is talking about. This is what Paul is preaching, this gospel that Jesus has changed everything about our life. So everything about our life ought to look different. Paul goes on in verse 15. So that you may be blameless and innocent. Let's, let's reverse a minute. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Or as the great prophet Rihanna said, shine bright like a diamond. Verse 16, <laughs> holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I didn't run in vain or labor in vain. God's plan for the church is that we should live in such a way that is so different from the rest of the world that people would notice that we shine bright like the stars in the sky. How do we do that? How is that possible in what Paul says is this crooked generation? We do it by holding fast to the word of God. Because we've got we've to spend time being with Jesus. How do we, how do we spend time being with Jesus in, in God's word? We've got to be with Jesus so that we become more like Jesus for the good of the world around us. We don't do that by being church people. We do that by being Jesus people. We get so stuck in this idea of doing church the way that we want, the way that we think it ought to be done, But never once has Jesus said in all of Scripture, hey, find you a place that you can go to church and be comfortable. No, Jesus never encourages us to find a a, a church home that fits most into our idea of what this ought to be. There are 34,548 people who live in San Juan Capistrano. 
And what everyone in this city needs is not just another church that becomes a social club with a morally overactive conscience and a very difficult entry point to find community. We don't need another church like that. What the city needs is a church that looks more and more like Jesus, which means it's our opportunity to work. And of course, it's God's power at work in us and through us. But our mission is the most critical mission on planet Earth. And we want everyone to know Jesus. And there are people in our community who don't know Jesus. There are people in our community who don't have a church home that they can find community and relationship that they're desperately looking for. And for this to happen, somebody needs to be sent. And I'm not necessarily talking about us sending a missionary to the outpost across planet Earth. Sometimes being a missionary like, looks like creating a space here in this building where someone can walk in today and feel like they came home, where they can see something of beauty, where they can feel like there's a place for them to belong, where they can see some reflection of the kingdom of God. But they can know in the atmosphere that there is grace and mercy here, a place for them to be with Jesus. Looks like creating a space for people who don't yet have categories for Jesus to discover that Jesus has compassion for them. We're talking about the very mission of the church, which is the very mission of your life, that you would see yourself as a conduit of the love of Jesus that as you marry and as you have kids, that as you work, as you interact with people, as you go to school, as you live retired, it doesn't matter what your status is, your marital status, your education status, your employment status, your gender, your 23 and me grouping, we are all conduits of God's love. And God has this expectation that you and I will take the hope of Jesus to the heart and the life of another, that they too may know what on earth they're here for. At Mountain View Church, we talk about the restoration of all things. But hear me say loud and clear that the restoration of all things starts with you and starts with you working. It doesn't end with you. God has restored you for a purpose. When we talk about this way of Jesus, when we talk about this way of Mountain View Church, we've got to come into alignment with what Jesus wants. And can I just tell you that the way that we do things here at Mountain View isn't about some beautiful building. It's not the beautiful people who show up or the beautiful songs that we sing or the handsome pastor who preaches or what you like, what I like, what you want what you don't want. Our prayer, our hope from kids to student ministries, from music to the ministries that are part of who we are is that God would work in us and through us here in this place. That the, the people of Mountain View Church, we're not perfect. We've all come from different places. We've got different backgrounds. We don't all look the same. We didn't all start the same with Jesus. But we are a city on a hill. And God is working and people's lives are changing. And there's something different about this place. We're not weird, but we are different. But to do this, we've got to be the church. Not just go to church. We've got to be the church every day. We've got to be the church in every way. And for that to happen, we got to be with Jesus. So we become like Jesus for the good of the world around us. What if we were known? What if Mountain View Church were known as the people who look like Jesus? What if we just started to live like Jesus, lead like Jesus? What if our preferences weren't a trigger for us? What if we didn't fight for our own rights but became more like Jesus and willfully gave up our preference and leaned in to this call of unity? We can do this and we can do it together by looking to Jesus who sacrificed his rights so that our lives and the lives of people in this community who don't yet know Jesus could find hope in him and community in this church. Let's pray together. 
God, we're humbled by this call that you have on our life. God, we count it an honor that you would consider us to be your salt and your light. And so Jesus, today, would you help us to sacrifice our preferences for the good of people who don't yet know you. God, would you help us? Would you give us the courage and the strength and the boldness to do hard things, to make hard decisions so that others can experience your love? God, would you use us as conduits of your grace and your love and your mercy? God, help us get unstuck from the culture wars of our day so that we can be so stuck on you that regardless of what happens around us, your fame and your name and your work are what we're all about. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.